Winnie Verloc, the widow of Mr. Verloc, the sister of the late faithful Stevie, blown to fragments in a state of innocence and in the conviction of being engaged in a humanitarian enterprise, did not run beyond the door of the parlor. She had indeed run away so far from a mere trickle of blood, but that was a movement of instinctive repulsion, and there she had paused, with staring eyes and lowered head, as though she had run through long years in her flight across the small parlor. Mrs. Verloc, by the door, was quite a different person from the woman who had been leaning over the sofa, a little swimmy in her head, but otherwise free to enjoy the profound calm of idleness and irresponsibility. Mrs. Verloc was no longer giddy. Her head was steady. On the other hand, she was no longer calm. She was afraid. If she avoided looking in the direction of her reposing husband, it was not because she was afraid of him. Mr. Verloc was not frightful to behold. He looked comfortable. Moreover, he was dead. Mrs. Verloc entertained no vain delusions on the subject of the dead. Nothing brings them back, neither love nor hate. They can do nothing to you. They are as nothing. Her mental state was tinged by a sort of austere contempt for that man who had let himself be killed so easily. He had been the master of a house, the husband of a woman, and the murderer of her Stevie, and now he was of no account in every respect. He was of less practical account than the clothing on his body, than his overcoat, than his boots, than that hat lying on the floor. He was nothing. He was not worth looking at. He was even no longer the murderer of poor Stevie. The only murderer that would be found in the room when people came to look for Mr. Verloc would be herself. Her hand shook so that she failed twice in the task of refastening her veil. Mrs. Verloc was no longer a person of leisure and responsibility. She was afraid. The stabbing of Mr. Verloc had been only a blow. It had relieved the pent-up agony of shrieks strangled in her throat, of tears dried up in her hot eyes, of the maddening, indignant rage at the atrocious part played by that man who was less than nothing now in robbing her of the boy. It had been an obscurely prompted blow, the blood trickling on the floor off the handle of the knife. It turned it into an extremely plain case of murder. Mrs. Verloc, who always refrained from looking deep into things, was compelled to look into the very bottom of this thing. She saw there no haunting face, no reproachful shade, no vision of remorse, no sort of ideal conception. She saw there an object. That object was the gallows. Mrs. Verloc was afraid of the gallows. She was terrified of them ideally, having never set eyes on that last argument of men's justice, except in illustrative woodcuts, to a certain type of tales. She first saw them erect against a black and stormy background, festooned with chains and human bones, circled about by birds that peck at dead men's eyes. This was frightful enough, but Mrs. Verloc, though not a well-informed woman, had a sufficient knowledge of the institutions of her country to know that the gallows are no longer erected romantically on the banks of dismal rivers or on wide-swept headlands, but in the yards of jails. There, within four high walls, as if into a pit, at dawn of day, the murderer was brought out to be executed with a horrible quietness and, as the reports in the newspapers always said, in the presence of the authorities. With her eyes staring on the floor, her nostrils quivering with anguish and shame, she imagined herself all alone amongst a lot of strange gentlemen in silk hats who were calmly proceeding about the business of hanging her by the neck. That never, never, and how was it done? 
The impossibility of imagining the details of such quiet execution added something maddening to her abstract terror. The newspapers never gave any details except one, but that one, with some affectation, was always there at the end of a meager report. Mrs. Verloc remembered its nature. It came with a cruel burning pain into her head, as if the words, the drop given was fourteen feet, had been scratched on her brain with a hot needle. The drop given was fourteen feet. These words affected her physically, too. Her throat became convulsed in waves to resist strangulation, and the apprehension of the jerk was so vivid that she seized her head in both hands as if to save it from being torn off her shoulders. The drop given was fourteen feet. No, that must never be. She could not stand that. The thought of it even was not bearable. She could not stand thinking of it. Therefore, Mrs. Verloc formed the resolution to go at once and throw herself into the river off one of the bridges. This time she managed to refasten her veil. With her face as if masked, all black from head to foot, except for some flowers in her hat, she looked up mechanically at the clock. She thought it must have stopped. She could not believe that only two minutes had passed since she had looked at it last. Of course not. It had been stopped all the time. As a matter of fact, only three minutes had elapsed from the moment she had drawn the first deep, easy breath after the blow to this moment when Mrs. Verloc formed the resolution to drown herself in the Thames. But Mrs. Verloc could not believe that. She seemed to have heard or read the, that clocks and watches always stopped at the moment of murder for the undoing of the murderer. She did not care. To the bridge, and over I go. But her movements were slow. She dragged herself painfully across the shop, and had to hold on to the handle of the door before she found the necessary fortitude to open it. The street frightened her, since it led either to the gallows or to the river. She floundered over the doorstep, head forward, arms thrown out like a person falling over the parapet of a bridge. This entrance into the open air had a foretaste of drowning. A slimy dampness enveloped her, entered her nostrils, clung to her hair. It was not actually raining, but each gas lamp had a rusty little halo of mist. The van and horses were gone, and in the black street, the curtained window of the Carter's eating house made a square patch of soiled blood-red light glowing faintly very near the level of the pavement. Mrs. Verloc, dragging herself slowly towards it, thought that she was a very friendless woman. It was true, it was so true, that in a sudden longing to see some friendly face, she could think of no one else but of Mrs. Neal, the charwoman. She had no acquaintance of her own. Nobody would miss her in a social way. It must not be imagined that the widow Verloc had forgotten her mother. This was not so, when he had been a good daughter because she had been a devoted sister. Her mother had always leaned on her for support. No consolation or advice could be expected there. Now that Stevie was dead, the bond seemed to be broken. She could not face the old woman with the horrible tale. Moreover, it was too far. The river was her present destination. Mrs. Verloc tried to forget her mother. Each step cost her an effort of will, which seemed the last possible. Mrs. Verloc had dragged herself past the red glow of the eating house window to the bridge, and over I go. She repeated herself with fierce obstinacy. She put out her hand just in time to steady herself against a lamp post. I'll never get there before morning, she thought. The fear of death paralyzed her efforts to escape the gallows. It seemed to her she had been staggering in that street for hours. I'll never get there, she thought. They'll find me knocking about the streets. It's too far. She held on, 
panting under her black veil. The drop given was fourteen feet. She pushed the lamp post away from her violently and found herself walking, but another wave of faintness overtook her like a great sea, washing away her heart clean out of her breast. I will never get there, she muttered, suddenly arrested, swaying lightly where she stood, never, and perceiving the utter impossibility of walking as far as the nearest bridge, Mrs. Verloc thought of a flight abroad. It came to her suddenly. Murderers escaped. They escaped abroad. Spain or California. Mere names. The vast world created for the glory of man was only a vast blank to Mrs. Verloc. She did not know which way to turn. Murderers had friends, relations, helpers. They had knowledge. She had nothing. She was the most lonely of murderers that ever struck a mortal blow. She was alone in London, and the whole town of marvels and mud, with its maze of streets and its mass of lights, was sunk in hopeless night, rested at the bottom of a black abyss from which no unaided woman could hope to scramble out. She swayed forward and made a fresh start blindly with an awful dread of falling down, but at the end of a few steps, unexpectedly, she found a sensation of support, of security. Raising her head, she saw a man's face peering closely at her veil. Comrade Ossipon was not afraid of strange women. No feeling of false delicacy could prevent him from striking an acquaintance with a woman apparently very much intoxicated. Comrade Ossipon was interested in women. He held up this one between his two large palms, peering at her in a business-like way, till he heard her say faintly, Mr. Ossipon, and then he very nearly let her drop to the ground. Mrs. Verloc, he exclaimed, you hear? It seemed impossible to him that she should have been drinking, but no one ever knows. He did not go into that question, but attentive not to discourage kind fate, surrendering to him the widow of Comrade Verloc, he tried to draw her to his breast. To his astonishment, she came quite easily, and even rested on his arms for a moment, before she attempted to disengage herself. Comrade Ossipon would not be brusque with kind fate. He withdrew his arm in a natural way. You recognized me, she faltered out standing before him, fairly steady on her legs. "'Of course I did,' said Ossipon, with perfect readiness. "'I was afraid you were going to fall. "'I have thought of you, too, often, lately, "'not to recognize you anywhere, at any time. "'I've always thought of you, ever since I first set eyes on you.' "'Mrs. Verloc seemed not to hear. "'You were coming to the shop,' she said nervously. "'Yes, at once,' answered Ossipon. Directly I read the paper. In fact, Comrade Ossipon had been skulking for a good two hours in the neighborhood of Brett Street, unable to make up his mind for a bold move. The robust anarchist was not exactly a bold conqueror. He remembered that Mrs. Verloc had never responded to his glances by the slightest sign of encouragement. Besides, he thought the shop might be watched by the police and Comrade Ossipon did not wish the police to form an exaggerated notion of his revolutionary sympathies. Even now, he did not know precisely what to do. In comparison with his usual amatory speculations, this was a big and serious undertaking. He ignored how much there was in it, and how far he would have to go in order to get a hold of what there was to get supposing there was a chance at all. These perplexities, checking his elation, imparted to his tone a soberness well in keeping with the circumstances. May I ask you where you are going? he inquired in a subdued voice. Don't ask me, cried Mrs. Verloc with a shuddering repressive violence. All her strong vitality recoiled from the idea of death. Never mind where I was going. 
Ossipon concluded that she was very much excited, but perfectly sober. She remained silent by his side for a moment. Then all at once she did something which she did not expect. She slipped her hand under his arm. He was startled by the act itself, certainly, and quite as much, too, by the palpably resolute character of, his, of this movement. But this being a delicate affair, Comrade Ossipon behaved with delicacy. He contented himself by pressing the hand slightly against his robust ribs. At the same time, he felt himself being impelled forward and yielded to the impulse. At the end of Brett Street, he became aware of being directed to the left. He submitted. The fruitier at the corner had put out the blazing glory of his oranges and lemons, and Brett Place was all darkness, interspersed with the misty halos of the few lamps, defining its triangular shape with a cluster of three lights on one stand in the middle. The dark forms of the man and woman glided slowly, arm in arm, along the walls with a lover-like and homeless aspect and the miserable night. What would you say if I were to tell you that I was going to find you? Mrs. Verloc asked, gripping his arm with force. I would say that you couldn't find anyone more ready to help you in your trouble, answered Ossipon, with a notion of making tremendous headway. In fact, the progress of this delicate affair was almost taking his breath away. In my trouble, Mrs. Verloc repeated slowly, yes. And do you know what my trouble is? She whispered with strange intensity. Ten minutes after seeing the evening paper, explained Ossipon with ardor, I met a fellow whom you may have seen once or twice at the shop, perhaps, and I had a talk with him, which left no doubt whatever in my mind that I started for here, wondering whether you, I've been fond of you beyond words ever since I set eyes on your face, he cried, as if unable to command his feelings. Comrade Ossipon assumed correctly that no woman was capable of wholly disbelieving such a statement, but he did not know that Mrs. Verloc accepted it with all the fierceness the instinct of self-preservation puts into the grip of a drowning person. To the widow of Mr. Verloc, the robust anarchist was like a radiant messenger of life. They walked slowly in step. I thought so, Mrs. Verloc murmured faintly. You read it in my eyes, suggested Ossipon with great assurance. Yes, she breathed out into his inclined ear. A love like mine could not be concealed from a woman like you, he went on, trying to detach his mind from material considerations, such as the business value of the shop and the amount of money Mr. Verloc might have left in the bank. He applied himself to the sentimental side of the affair. In his heart of hearts, he was a little shocked at his success. Verloc had been a good fellow, and certainly a very decent husband as far as one could see. However, Comrade Ossipon was not going to quarrel with his luck for the sake of a dead man, Resolutely, he suppressed his sympathy for the ghost of Comrade Verloc and went on. I could not conceal it. I was too full of you. I dare say you cannot help seeing it in my eyes, but I could not guess it. You are always so distant. What else did you expect? burst out Mrs. Verloc. I was a respectable woman. She paused, then added, as if speaking to herself in sinister resentment, till he made me what I am. Ossipon let that pass, and took up his running. He never did seem to me to be quite worthy of you. He began, throwing loyalty to the winds. You were worthy of a better fate. Mrs. Verloc interrupted bitterly. Better fate? He cheated me out of seven years of life. You seemed to live so happily with him. Ossipon tried to exculpate paid the lukewarmness of his past conduct. It's that what's made me timid. You seemed to love him. I was surprised and jealous, he added. Love him? Mrs. Verloc cried out in a whisper full of scorn and rage. Love him? I was a good wife to him. I'm a respectable woman. You thought I loved him? You did? Look here, Tom. 
The sound of his name thrilled Comrade Ossipon with pride, for his name was Alexander, and he was called Tom by arrangement with the most familiar of his intimates. It was a name of friendship, of moments of expansion. He had no idea that she had ever heard it used by anyone. It was apparent that she had not only caught it, but had treasured it in her memory, perhaps in her heart. Look here, Tom. I was a young girl. I was done up. I was tired. I had two people depending on what I could do, and it did seem as if I couldn't do any more. Two people, mother and the boy. He was much more mine than mother's. I sat up nights and nights with him on my lap, all alone upstairs, when I wasn't more than eight years old myself. And then he was mine, I tell you. You can't understand that. No man can understand it. What was I to do? There was a young fellow. The memory of the early romance with the young butcher survived, tenacious, like the image of a glimpsed ideal in that heart quailing before the fear of the gallows and full of a revolt against death. That was the man I loved then, went on the widow of Mr. Gerlach. I suppose he could see it in my eyes, too. Five and twenty shillings a week, and his father threatened to kick him out of the business if he made such a fool of himself as to marry a girl with a crippled mother and a crazy idiot of a boy on her hands. But he would hang about me, till one evening I found the courage to slam the door in his face. I had to do it. I loved him dearly. Five and twenty shillings a week. There was that other man, a good lodger. What is a girl to do? Could I have gone on the streets? He seemed kind. He wanted me anyway. What was I to do with mother and that poor boy, eh? I said yes. He seemed good-natured. He was free-handed. He had money. He never said anything. Seven years. Seven years a good wife to him. The kind, the good, the generous. The... And he loved me. Oh, yes, he loved me till I sometimes wished myself. Seven years. Seven years a wife to him. And do you know what he was, that dear friend of yours? Do you know what he was? He was a devil. The superhuman vehemence of that whispered statement completely stunned Comrade Ossipan. Winnie Verloc, turning about, held him by both arms, facing him under the falling mist and the darkness and solitude of Brett Place, in which all sounds of life seemed lost as if in a triangular well of asphalt and bricks, of blind houses and unfeeling stones. No, I didn't know, he declared with a sort of flabby stupidity, whose comical aspect was lost upon a woman haunted by the fear of the gallows. But I do know, I... I understand, he floundered on, his mind speculating as to what sort of atrocious verloc could have practiced under the sleepy, placid appearances of his married estate. It was positively awful. I understand, he repeated, and then, by a sudden inspiration, uttered an unhappy woman of lofty commiseration instead of the more, more familiar poor darling of his usual practice. This was no usual case. He felt conscious of something abnormal going on, while he never lost sight of the greatness of the stake. Unhappy, brave woman. He was glad to have discovered that variation, but he could discover nothing else. Ah, but he is dead now, was the best he could do, and he put a remarkable amount of animosity into his guarded exclamation. Mrs. Verloc caught at his arm with a sort of frenzy. You guessed, then, he was dead, she murmured, as if beside herself. You, you guessed what I had to do. Had to do. There were suggestions of triumph, relief, gratitude, in the indefinable tone of these words. It engrossed the whole attention of Ossipan to the detriment of mere literal sense. He wondered what was up with her why she had worked herself into the state of wild excitement. He even began to wonder whether the hidden causes of that 
Greenwich Park affair did not lie deep in the unhappy circumstances of the Verloc's married life. He went so far as to suspect Mr. Verloc of having selected that extraordinary manner of committing suicide. By Jove, that would account for the utter inanity and wrongheadedness of the thing. No anarchist manifestation was required by the circumstances. Quite the contrary, and Verloc was as well aware that as any other revolutionist of his standing. What an immense joke if Verloc had simply made fools of the whole of Europe, of the revolutionary world, of the police, of the press, and of the cocksure professor as well. Indeed, thought Ossipon, in astonishment, it seemed almost certain that he did. Poor beggar! It struck him as very possible that of that household of two, it wasn't precisely the man who was the devil. Alexander Ossipon, nicknamed the doctor, was naturally inclined to think indulgently of his men friends. He eyed Mrs. Verloc, hanging on his arm. Of his women friends, he thought in a special, practical way. Why Mrs. Verloc should exclaim at his knowledge of Mr. Verloc's death, which was no guess at all, did not disturb him beyond measure. They often talked like lunatics. But he was curious to know how she had been informed. The papers could tell her nothing beyond the mere fact, the man blown to pieces in Greenwich Park, not having been identified. It was inconceivable on any theory that Mr. Verloc should have given her an inkling of his intention, whatever it was. This problem interested Comrade Ossipon immensely. He stopped short. They had gone, then, along three sides of Brett Place, and were near the end of Brett Street again. How did you first come to hear of it? he asked in a tone he tried to render appropriate to the character of the revelations which had been made to him by the woman at his side. She looked violently for a while before she answered in a listless voice. From the police, a chief inspector came. Chief Inspector Heat, he said he was. He showed me. Mrs. Verloc choked. Oh, Tom, they had to gather him up with a shovel. Her breast heaved with dry sobs. In a moment, Ossipon found his tongue. The police? Do you mean to say the police came already? The chief inspector, Heat, himself actually came to tell you? Yes, she confirmed in the same listless tone. He came just like this. He came. I didn't know. He showed me a piece of overcoat, just like that. Do you know this, he says? Heat, heat. And what did he do? Mrs. Verloc's head dropped. Nothing. He did nothing. He went away. The police were on that man's side, she murmured tragically. Another one came, too. Another. Another inspector, do you mean? asked Ossipon, in great excitement and very much in the tone of a scared child. I don't know. He came. He looked like a foreigner. He may have been one of the embassy people. Comrade Ossipon nearly collapsed under this new shock. Embassy? Are you aware of what you are saying? What embassy? What on earth do you mean by embassy? It's that place in Chesham Square. The people he cursed so. I don't know. What does it matter? And that fellow, what did he do or say to you? I don't remember. Nothing. I don't care. Don't ask me, she pleaded in a weary voice. All right, I won't, assented Ossipon tenderly, and he meant it, too. Not because he was touched by the pathos of the pleading voice, but because he felt himself losing his footing in the depths of this tenebrous affair. Police, embassy, few, for fear of adventuring his intelligence into ways where its natural lights might fail to guide it safely, he dismissed resolutely all suppositions, surmises, and theories out of his mind. He had the woman there, absolutely flinging herself at him, and that was the principal consideration. But after what he had heard, nothing could astonish him any more, and when Mrs. Verloc, as if startled suddenly out of a dream of safety, began to urge upon him wildly the necessity of an immediate flight on the continent, he did not exclaim in the least. He simply said with an unaffected regret 
that there was no train till the morning, and stood looking thoughtfully at her face, veiled in black net, and the light of a gas lamp, veiled in a gauze of mist. Near him her black form merged in the night, like a figure half chiseled out of a block of black stone. It was impossible to say what she knew, how deep she was involved with policemen and embassies. But if she wanted to get away, it was not for him to object. He was anxious to be off himself. He felt that the business, the shop so strangely familiar to chief inspectors and members of foreign embassies, was not the place for him. That must be dropped, but there was the rest, the savings, the money. You must hide me till the morning somewhere, she said in a dismayed voice. Fact is, my dear, I can't take you where I live. I share the room with a friend. He was somewhat dismayed himself. In the morning, the blessed texts will be out, and all the stations, no doubt. And if they once get hold of her, for one reason or another, she would be lost to him indeed. But you must. Don't you care for me at all? At all? What are you thinking of? She said this violently, but she let her clasp hands fall in discouragement. There was a silence while the mist fell and darkness reigned undisturbed over Brett Place. Not a soul, not even the vagabond, lawless, and amorous soul of a cat came near the man and the woman facing each other.